Welcome, welcome, my friends. Today, we are going into the topic of the PMP exam. And my goal is to help you to better understand how to get certified as quickly as possible, how not to fall into the traps that I did, that other people have, and how to just all together, all round, be as expedient as possible in your PMP exam pursuits. Now, I understand that some of you are new to the PMP exam. Some of you do not know what exactly it entails and what it means. But throughout this presentation, I will be touching on the most important points for you. So let me break it down really quick. Okay, PMP exam is 230 minutes. 180 questions. Majority of them are multiple choice questions. You could have some drag and drop, and you could have some choose more than one. You need to do the best you possibly can to be on par with what your peers who are project managers are doing on this exam. And if you're able to get up to par, you'll become a PMP. That's the summary. 230 minutes, 180 questions, you're going to be tested across people interaction, leadership, communications. You're going to be tested on the process aspect of project management. And last but not least, the business aspect. If I was going to give you a couple more slides before you jump off this call, because I know time is money and some of you are on lunch break, I would like you to journey with me when you are carrying out this operation for PMP certification. And the way to do this is through my 35 hour course, and you can get it at tinyurl.com forward slash elite PMP. That's tinyurl.com forward slash elite PMP. It will lead you to the page where you can sign up and you can learn a whole lot more. Okay. And that's the high level summary. So, Thank you for joining. Again, my name is Phil. I'll give you a little bit of my background. I got certified as a project management professional in 2005. I got certified because a really awesome colleague of mine introduced me to the world of the PMI. And her name is Mary Hirschner. She ended up becoming my mentor, introducing me to the world of the PMI. And kind of like you, I was wondering, should I do it? Should I not, you know, ask my boss, should I do it? And my boss said, don't do it, don't do it. But I'm glad I didn't listen because I wouldn't have been able to get out. <laughs> I escaped from the company I was in and I escaped and I was making 300% more than what I was making in that firm. It's a crazy story. So that's a little bit of my background. I have various certifications in project management. You might have encountered me on YouTube. I'm very passionate about project management and agile. I see business as being both of these things. In order to run a good business, you need to have great project management. And in order for your project management to be truly great, you need to be thinking agile. Um, I train a lot of these courses with my buddy, Roy. His name's Roy Schilling, that's him on the screen. And uh, Roy's my agile coach. And, helps me navigate the world of Agile, and I will be teaching you a little bit of Agile today. The company behind this is Praiseon. In fact, if you go to praiseon.com, you can check out more of our material, more information about us. But let's get straight into the PMP exam. So I'm going to give you a lot of background. This is going to be about an hour, okay? So you might want to bookmark it and come back if you're on a short lunch break, but I'm going to try and get through them as quickly as possible. I have about 60 slides for you. So the, the summary is this, PMI is a project management institute. They were founded in 1969. These awesome individuals on the screen, they came up with the idea for the Project Management Institute. And the Project Management Institute has been around since 1969. It's a nonprofit. And since they came on the map, they have been instrumental in putting project management into the process in a lot of companies. and coming up with exams like the Project Management Professional, which we're talking about today, the CAPM, the PGMP, the ACP, the RMP. There's so many of them, and, and they all mean something. Seriously, they do mean something. But PMP means Project Management Professional, okay? 
The PMP exam is usually linked to a book known as the PMBOK Guide. And the PMBOK Guide, PMBOK just stands for Project Management Body of Knowledge Guide. I'm going to show you what these look like. Okay, now the exam is not based on these books, but these are standards. And when you are taking an exam that is linked to standards in some way, you do need to know the standard to do the best you can, right? So we have a couple of PMBOK guides. We have the PMBOK guide 7th edition, which is the one in circulation now. And we have one called a 6th edition, which is no longer in circulation, but is quite popular. And the reason is the 6th edition goes into a lot of heavy process, and it gives beginners a clear idea of what project management is from a traditional perspective. Okay, now there's some other books that are used for this exam, but those two, they're the ones that you hear the most, all right? So the PMBOK guide, it provides a common lexicon and a standard for project management. As we traverse this journey, we might as well talk about the definition of project management. It's applying knowledge and skills and tools and techniques and leadership and all the great skills you've got to a project in order to derive the output, which should in turn yield value. And when we net all that value, we get benefits, right? So benefits and value are things we look for from a project. And at the end of the day, that output not only gives you benefits and value, but it leads to a desired outcome, whatever that outcome is. So project management is the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities to produce a specific deliverable and in turn, you obviously want to get some output from that. A few terms that you will hear in this journey, you'll hear the term program, and a program is just two or more interrelated projects that are managed in a coordinated way. Here's an example. A program, you've got project A, B, and C. So assume project A was a hardware project, project B was a software project, and uh, project B, a software project, project C, the integration. Together, we're managing them as one unit, a program. And the reason why we do this is just to get better bang for the buck, better benefits, better control, you know, common sense. It's like buy one, get one free. Why do you want to manage things disjointedly when they're unified, right, towards what they're meant to achieve? That's the general idea. And then we have things like sub-programs, sub-projects. Those are smaller pieces of a program, right? A sub-program is a smaller piece of a program. A sub-project is a smaller piece of a project. So you are going to hear that quite a bit. When we talk about program management, we could break it down in a number of ways, but I like the way Prince2 has it. Uh, the glossary of terms, it just says, the coordinated and intentional management of one or more interrelated programs to deliver benefits and gain better control. So you're going to hear these words. For those of you who are in the world of operations and you're like, I don't know if I should take this exam. I don't even know if I qualify. Maybe we can have a discussion, but we talk about operations in this world as well. And operations are just an ongoing endeavor that are undertaken to support the business. All right. So high level overview of the PMP exam, the project management professional. It's offered by the PMI, globally recognized credential in the project management domain. I would advise that you understand the basics. I'm teaching you the basics now, right? To get PMP certified, you got a number of buckets, and I'll be showing you the options. But if you have a degree, equivalent of a bachelor's, that is, and you have 4,500 hours, which really boils down to three years, right? So just say you have a degree and three years of project management experience, leading, directing projects, and you have 35 contact hours of formal project management education, you're set. Now, those of you that don't have a degree, you need five years of experience, which amounts to about 7,500 hours, but it's five literal years. You must go through the passage of time. That is important for your application. And for those of you that have a CAPM, which is another certification from the PMI, Certified Associate in Project Management, well, you just skip all the other requirements. It's like you're playing that game and you just hit the magic button and you, you just bypass all all the modalities and red tape, your cap M, you are eligible to take the PMP exam as long as you have the other pieces, right? The experience, uh, you need to have the three years or the five years, but you don't need the 35 hours. That is waived if you've got the cap M, okay? So 
understanding the basics, I would say go to PMI's website, download the PMP handbook if you need to, um, read it, and uh, ask me questions. I'm here to answer questions, all right? So I'll be checking the comments every now and again. Um, if I find any questions in the comments, I will be sure to answer them. Uh, but let's keep going. Let's move on to the next slide. So check your eligibility based on what I just said. Are you eligible to take the PMP exam? Are you? Do you have a degree? Do you have the eligibility information I shared? So here we go. Four-year degree, three-year degree or the equivalent, right? 36 months, which is three years leading projects, 35 hours of project management education or a CAPM certification. Uh, for those who don't have a degree, then a high school diploma or an associate's degree, same, you know, band here, uh, 60 months, five years, and then 35 hours of project management education or the CAPM. I would advise that you join the PMI as a member because the exam is free, it's, it's cheaper. I almost said free. No, it's not free. The exam is less if you are a member. Um, what is free is the PMBOK guide. So you get the PDFs. Uh, the downloads of this, that is free, uh, but the exam will be cheaper. The exam will be 400 and something dollars. Uh, it will not be as high as normal if you are a PMI member. So I recommend go to PMI.org, hit become a member, become a member. You don't have to become a member uh, perpetually. It's not like every single year, but for your first year, I would recommend at least trying it out. Be a member for the first year. You can download the, the PMBOK guides and all the other standards. There's a whole lot of other uh, really great things that you get from being a member. Now, trust me, I'm not trying to sell you membership because I'm not affiliated with PMI in that way. But having worked with PMI as a registered education provider in the past, I know firsthand the benefits of being a member. They're just immense benefits. You get uh, discounts on the exams, all of the exams. Uh, you're able to download the standards for free. Um, you, you get a whole lot of benefits, which I can't go into all of them. Uh, in addition to that, after you get certified, if you wanted to keep up your PMP or whatever certification, you can go onto PMI's website. They've got a sister website, projectmanagement.com, and uh, you're able to attend webinars at no additional cost. So it's a good deal, okay? So going down there, I want to make this pragmatic, okay? So this is not one of those death by PowerPoint meetings. I want to, want to make that clear. Feel free to ask questions, but I'm going to show you how to jump into PMI site and how to do all these things that I'm talking about. To register as a member, you just need to go to the membership tab and you just need to hit become a member, fill in all the information and you become a member and you'll be able to download the PMBOK guides, the exam will be less and so on. Um, to learn more about the exam, just go on to certifications, click on PMP right there, and uh, all you need to do is hit continue and you can begin your application like right now. Um, there's some other helpful information down at the bottom of the page, which I'd like to show you. So this is called the PMP exam content outline. The content outline breaks down the exam uh, into the domains that you're gonna be tested on. Let me make this bigger, excuse me. All right, there we go, that's better. So here you can see this is the breakdown of the exam. It's broken down into these buckets that I was talking about, people, process, and business. Uh, but going beyond that, if we go all the way down here, this is the eligibility information for the exam, right? So you've got the educational background, maybe you've got a secondary school diploma, then you need five years of education, or you've got a four-year degree or the global equivalent. It doesn't have to be four years, like here in the United States, a lot of three-year degrees and so on. So the equivalent, right? And the experience you need is 36 months of professional, non-overlapping project management experience. And that just means you can't double count. So if you're managing three projects in one year, you can't say, well, that counts for one year for each project. You can't do that. It has to be three literal years, okay? So... I wanted you to know that this was out there. This is uh, on PMI's website. I'm actually going to copy this and put it in the chat. To get certified, you need 35 hours of project management education. And to get that education right there, you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash elite PMP, and uh, you can get the 35 contact hours you need via my course on Udemy. 
There are many additional resources that people use for the exam. I have a few books that I have written for this exam. Let me see if I can bring up one or two of my books. So for those who study with me, there's a couple of books here. One of these books is called Agile Principle Run and Cut. This tackles the Agile piece. Another book is called uh, Project Management Essentials. These are books I've written for the exam, so they help simplify what is in the standard. So if you're going to study with me, these are some of the materials that you would get. I would also recommend taking mock exams. There are a lot of mock exams in the books, a lot of mock exams on my course, lots of questions to help people. Um, I would highly recommend that, but I would say be careful. This is a big warning to people who just take random free mock exams. Not only are some of those mock exams outdated, but some of those mock exams could also have information that could be harmful. For example, there are companies that are involved in shady practices and they think they're being smart. They, they send people out or they employ people who have taken the exam to harvest questions. And very recently, PMI has cracked down on any kind of cheating. So you don't want to expose yourself to the wrong question banks. Highly advise you to beware. You know, don't just take random quizzes, random mock exams. Make sure you're taking them from a tested and tried source. That is very important. Regarding the application submission, uh, you can submit your PMP application via the PMI website. Uh, in the next few seconds, I will show you how you can complete your PMP application. So I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to open up a blank slide. And I'll just show you a very quick demo. So if you're filling your PMP application, remember you need projects that you have worked on as a project manager. Now, even though your title was not project manager, you may have managed the project. So we're not saying if your title isn't project manager, then you cannot be certified. That's not what we're saying. You just need to make sure that whatever you're putting forward, you can back it up. So let's say I'm working on a project and this is, a, I'm just gonna call it software development project. The best way to document your experience is by breaking it down into the five process groups. And I'm going to show you that very quickly. It's very straightforward. Every project needs to be initiated. Okay. And that just means authorized. Every project needs to be planned. Every project needs to be executed. Every project needs to be monitored and controlled. And every project needs to be closed. If you break your exam, down, you break your application down for the exam in, like this, uh, it helps the person reviewing your application to be able to pinpoint what exactly you did. And it just makes the process quicker. My advice to you is to cut out anything technical because that is not project management. So the kinds of things you would put in an application would be things like uh, I was project manager for this endeavor and was involved in creating project charter and stakeholder register. I worked with the project sponsor to identify and document project benefits. Whatever you did, okay? I'm not saying take these words exactly, but I'm saying use this as an example of how you could complete the application by putting only those things that are project management specific. You don't want to put stuff that is not project management specific. For example, um, I developed code I wrote test scripts. That will not fly. Um, I have had an application rejected in the past, and I know firsthand what not to put in the application. Don't put the technical stuff. If you're an engineer, don't put, I designed buildings or bridges. 
they don't want to hear that. They want to know what part of managing the bridge or part of managing the build as a project manager did you do? So that's one of the common mistakes people make on this exam. For planning, you could put something like um, developed project management plan that defined the scope, schedule, cost, quality, and all other areas on the project. Worked with the project team ensure realistic time, cost, and scope estimates. For example, these are, again, examples. Executing, you could say, involved in leading and directing the project work through regular touch points, meetings, and stakeholder interaction. Okay, now there's a, there's a number of words PMI is looking for, so uh, you need to make sure that you get the right number of words uh, in what you're doing. Let's make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. There we go. All right, so this is pretty much how you could proceed with it. My buddy, Ed, thank you, Ed, appreciate that. Thank you, Ed. Ed is one of my alumni from the world of CAPM and PMP, and also with our Project Leadership Institute. Thank you, Ed, for coming through. All right, Ed knows he's been here, he's been down this journey. Uh, monitoring and controlling, you could say, created work performance reports and showed the project proceeding planned. The language is very simplistic. It's very, very simplistic, but trust me when I tell you the PMI, they're not looking for lofty stuff. Just tell us what you did as a project manager and we're good the technicality. I know it fascinates you. I'm a civil engineer. I know there are a lot of technicalities that fascinate us as technical people or whatever domain you're in. IT, coding, testing, they don't want to know. Just tell them, this is what I worked on. This is what I did as a project manager. And then you can have the outcome so you can say uh, successfully close the project. Uh, and then in the output, you can say uh, outcome, uh, project, or you could say software successfully deployed on schedule and on budget, even though it doesn't make any difference. Like I said, they just want to know, did you really manage a project as a project manager? That's it. All right, so I want to invite you to ask questions. If there are any questions about the application, uh, now would be a good time to ask before we move on. Any questions? My friends on YouTube, I apologize if I'm not seeing your questions, but I'm guessing that if you had any, I would see them in this common screen. Okay, feel free to take a screenshot. Um, I have another video somewhere on, on YouTube about how to fill in the application if you need help in that regard. Okay, all right, let's move on. So when your application has been approved, I would highly advise you to just schedule your exam. There are a lot of you that have not scheduled your exam. PMI has reviewed your application. By the way, you don't need to pay until your application is approved. Uh, after your application is approved, then you can pay the, the fee and then you can schedule your exam at a Pearson test center. The next step would be to sit for the exam. So the, the real number is 230. Four hours is close to four hours. I mean, technically speaking, you got 10 minutes and 10 minutes on the back end, but it's really more like 
230 minutes. So I would say 230 minutes or 180 multiple choice questions. And this boils down to roughly 75 seconds per question. For those of you who are curious to know what do the questions look like, I'm going to show you very quickly here an example or two. So this is a montage of how the questions could look. So let's go over here. So over there, you can see it says you're working on, on an agile team as a contributor. What are some of the names for this role? Now, this is not the level of question. I'm just showing you that you've got A, B, C, D. The questions are going to be longer and more ferocious, <laughs> maybe more like this. So your project requires N95 masks to be worn in the hospitals. Vendor X sends you an email one week into the delivery date stating that there will be a delay due to mail service delays. Now, this is the longer end of the spectrum of questions. They are generally three lines long, you know, depending on how big the screen is. But this would be like the higher end. And you could get questions this long, but this would be like the longer type of questions. Um, the questions generally fall somewhere into the three line two to three line category based on what you're seeing on the screen. You could also get some situations where the answers are longer than the question. So you could get a short question and several options and you got to read through them. So that's generally how the exam is. Okay. Okay. So moving beyond what I showed you, let's talk a little bit more about the exam. 180 multiple choice questions, 230 minutes. There are only 175 questions that count because there are five that are pre-test questions. They put them more as experimental questions to act as a survey, but you wouldn't know that. You just have to answer all the questions to the best of your ability. For those asking what the passing score on the exam is, the passing score is currently undisclosed. The questions are very situational. Uh, PMI also evaluates proficiency levels in each project domain. So like I said, you've got these three overarching domains. You've got the people domain, which is 42% of the exam. You got the process domain, 50% of the exam, and the business domain, 8% of the exam. Okay. The people domain relates more to human interactions, communications, and leadership. The process domain goes into heavy process stuff, like across agile, across predictive methods. And then the business domain is more about business and how agile, predictive, and hybrid uh, relate to the business area in a firm, for example. To give you a pie visual of this, you got people, process, business. You can see that process is big, like the biggest piece of the pie. We can also split the exam into agile and hybrid and then predictive. So agile and hybrid is 50%. Predictive is 50% on its own. So very big. Um, if you don't know one of these, you could easily fail the exam. If you're good in predictive and bad in agile, well, you're not going to pass the test, right? Likely not going to pass the test, except you can wing it or fluff it or guess. So my recommendation, if you're taking this exam, is go for very good training that gets you on par with um, Agile and Predictive. The last thing I'm going to do is just show you how to think in an Agile fashion, right? I often say Agile is a mindset. Uh, don't be moved by people who say Agile is a methodology or framework. That's wrong. Agile is a mindset, and it's a posture. It's a philosophy. That's what it is. If you haven't studied the Agile Manifesto and you're taking the exam, I want to encourage you to just go on down to the website, agilemanifesto.org, and you'll be able to read the Agile Manifesto online. And this is pretty much the Agile Manifesto, right? And I have a lot of videos on this, so I'm not really going to go into this today. But the general mindset is 
you got to value people and how they interact over processes and tools. you got to value having a work in product than just comprehensive documentation. you got to value customer collaboration over contract negotiation and value responding to change over following a plan. You see, it's a mindset. It's a posture that puts you into that customer focused uh, mindset. We also have 12 principles in this world and I'm gonna go over them very quick. Satisfy the customer, number one. Number two, welcome changes, even late in development. Again, it's agile, right? So don't begrudge the agile mindset. I have a lot of people saying, well, that won't work in my firm or that won't work on my projects, but it works on some projects. Right. But again, it's a mindset. Welcome changes as late as possible, especially if it isn't causing that much trouble. You know why? Because agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. It's a mindset. Number three, deliver working product frequently so you can get great feedback in a timely fashion. Number four, business people and developers should work together daily because this is the world of agile. Things happen quick. We got to respond quick, right? We got to work together quick. In the world of agile, we generally have short iterations of two weeks. That's the sweet spot. They could be anywhere from four weeks or less. But the general idea is work together daily so that you can get feedback and so that you can respond as expediently as possible. Number five, build projects around a motivated team. Number six, communicate face-to-face -face where possible. There are times you may not be able to be face-to-face, -face, but you can turn on the camera, right? So again, these are just ideas, okay? I have um, our friend, Il Vento. Il Vento, good to see you. Uh, and the question is, is that live? Yes, this is live right now. <laughs> it depends on when you're listening to it. But it is live. The time right now to timestamp it is 12.37 PST. Um, for those on the East Coast, it's 3.37 PST. So if you have any questions, definitely ask, and I'll be more than happy to answer. Number seven, working product is a primary measure of progress. Uh, number eight, oh, I didn't tell you the day. I should have told you the day, right? I should have told you that this is October 3rd. It is October 3rd, 2023. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Okay. Okay. Working product is a primary measure of progress. So in this world, we really focus on getting a working product out, not just statuses and 99.9 .9 and 98s and 90s. No, no, no. The, the main thing is, is, is it done? Are we done? That's the primary measure of progress. It's a mindset. Okay. Not to say that statuses are bad. But that is not how we roll in Agile because we've already broken it down into tinier iterations. And the question then is, will you be done? Will you be done when we get to the end of the sprint or not? See, it's a different way of thinking. Number eight, Agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. It didn't say fast pace, constant pace. Okay, thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. How is Italy doing today? What's the time there? It's about 9.39, if I'm not mistaken, or thereabouts. Let me know. Let me know how it's going and, and when your exam is scheduled. All right, number nine, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Just think about it. When you pay more attention to technical excellence, it reduces the amount of fan cleaning you need to do because no one's making a mess like that, right? So when you spend time thinking about good design, the great Steve Jobs, he said, Design is not what it looks like or what it feels like. Design is how it works. So how it works, when you really have good design and great attention to that, it just enhances your agility, reduces technical debt. Simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. This is just saying cut out the fat. Cut out as much fat as possible. Number 11, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from a self-organizing team. And last but not least, we have at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. So what are we saying here? All we're saying here is you should take some time out, have a retrospective where possible, 
but don't have a retrospective only at the end of the sprint. Have a mindset of Kaizen to constantly improve. That's what this is saying. All right. So I know that lots of you know about Agile, you know about the manifesto, and you probably know about the different frameworks, but not everyone does. So for those of you that do not, I want to begin to introduce you to the world of Scrum, because Scrum is an Agile-oriented framework, and you are likely to get questions that touch on Scrum. So I'm going to touch on Scrum before we close today, okay? So what is Scrum? Scrum is a way that we solve problems, complex problems. It is a very simple way of solving problems. It's a framework that allows you to bring in additional things, but at the same time, we are careful to not mindlessly cut stuff out of Scrum. We want to leave it intact for it to truly be Scrum. Now, there are a lot of Scrum and Agile zealots who like arguing this point. I don't like belaboring the point. The bottom line is keep it 100. If you want to add, add. Don't take out because it will not be Scrum any longer. And that's okay. You can have a hybrid approach, but don't sacrifice things in Scrum mindlessly. The people who argue, well, we shouldn't have this event. Don't listen to those people for your exam. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Don't listen to them. So how does it start? In this idea, we can see a group of stakeholders gathered around an individual. That individual is called a product owner. The product owner is that role who understands the stakeholders. You can also see the product owner sitting on a bunch of money. Why is that? Because a product owner is referred to in Agile circles as the chief value officer. Think about it. The product owner knows what is valuable and ensures that only those things are done. All right, let's move on. So the product owner collects all of these requests that the stakeholders have and puts it into a product backlog. You get it? Backlog, it's a log of things that are possibly going to be done doesn't mean they are all going to be done. Some of these might be out of scope. Yes, even in Agile, we have things that are out of scope. So we have a product backlog, and this is all of the stuff the customers want. Then we have an event called sprint planning. In sprint planning, we decide which of these things in the backlog are we going to do in the sprint, and we get a sprint backlog. The sprint backlog is a subset of the product backlog, okay? We get the sprint backlog, and then we begin to do. Now, be aware that the moment you are doing sprint planning, you're already in the sprint, because the sprint is like this. Let me show you real quick. The sprint in the world of Scrum is a container for all the other events. All the other events happen within the sprint. So if this is the sprint, you have sprint planning, which we've talked about. You also have the daily Scrum, which I'm about to show you over here, the daily Scrum. And the daily Scrum is a daily event. Duh, it says daily. Uh, it's a daily event. It's funny because some people say, well, we have a daily scrum weekly. Uh, no, that's not a daily scrum. <laughs> that's not scrum, right? So it's daily. We also have what we call a sprint review and a sprint retrospective. And that's all the five of them. So I'm going to show you how the others come in. So now you know about sprint planning and the sprint backlog, and you know what a sprint is. It's an iteration. So the iteration is a time box within which everything else fits. And like I said, we have a daily scrum, and this is where the team syncs up to plan for the day ahead. And it is very helpful to know what your colleagues who are developers have completed because maybe it frees you to work on something or it prompts you to work on something. One of the things we don't want to do in the daily scrum is use this as a status meeting we also don't want to go down the 
rabbit trail of trying to solve problems in the daily scrum. So keep that in mind. We uncover problems. We uncover impediments, obstacles, blockers. You know, we uncover these things, but we want to make sure that uh, they are taken care of after the meeting, not in the meeting. Um, impediments impede you and slow you down. Obstacles are in the way, and it takes time and effort going around them or going over them. And then we have blockers, which is dead in the water. You're just stopped. You can't move. So all these three, they're all things that should be worked on. But hopefully, before it gets so severe that you can't move, you've already started seeing the train coming. The moment you see, even before impediments, you should be able to see a risk coming, right? Sometimes you don't. But when you do, you should go after that risk and prevent it from becoming an impediment as much as possible. And then if you don't, the impediment festers and becomes worse. It could become an obstacle. Then it becomes a full-on blocker. You don't want that to happen. And that's why these meetings are important. These events are important, right? So to the the, the resistance that, that don't like meeting daily, I don't know what to say to you. I don't know what to say. I got some people who don't like the events. Anyway, let me move on. Let me move on. All right. The next thing that I want to bring to your attention is PMI's mention of the, the backlog refinement event. It is not a formal event in the Scrum Guide, which is the uh, go-to book for Scrum, but it is something that should be done. It is mentioned as one of the responsibilities of the product owner whether we do it in a backlog refinement event or whether we do it elsewhere, it should be done. Otherwise, you could be in trouble in your sprint planning. You know, you come into sprint planning, you haven't done any backlog refinement, you're trying to break things down. It's going to be laborious and take too long. All right, let's move on. So the final thing here on this screen is an increment, right? You get the increment out. The increment means potentially shippable increment. And this just means that you get something that you could ship if you needed to, and it meets the definition of done. Your increment is out. The next thing that we talk about is a sprint review event. And this is where your stakeholders, as you can see there, they gathered around taking a look at the increment and you know critiquing the increment and giving you ideas of what you may do better, what you may do in the next sprint and things such as that. All right, we've got a chat from our friend here in Italy, and our friend says, uh, I have not booked the exam yet. I would like to take it in November. I'm looking for resources. Oh, on business analysis. Oh, CAPM. <laughs> on the CAPM. So, you, so you're taking the CAPM, I see. Um, with that said, for the CAPM, you know that I do have a book on the CAPM exam, uh, and it's a very robust book. In fact, I'll show it to you here. I would highly recommend this book. This is going outside of PMP, but because you mentioned business analysis, I wanted to add value to you and let you know that we got a book available. Uh, you can't really see it very well, but it's called the Cap M Masterclass. The imagery has gone funny because it's kind of green, but it's called the Cap M Exam Masterclass. It's about almost 500 plus pages. Um, you can actually get that book um, on our site. I'm, I may have to look for that and send that to you. But um, if you want to take a good CAPM training course, I would recommend going to tinyurl.com forward slash elite CAPM, elite CAPM, and um, you'll be able to join me for that because I train the CAPM exam as well. Thank you for letting me know that. Yeah, tinyurl.com forward slash elite CAPM. All right, so the final thing that happens in Scrum is the sprint retrospective, and this is where the team looks in the rearview mirror, what went well, what didn't, what can we improve on, and you can actually get a couple or more, depending on improvement points. Uh, this is not mandatory, but people are encouraged to think Kaizen, think Kaizen. So you're always looking for how can I improve, what can I do, such and such. All right, and these are really big concepts for your PMP. The final concept before we go, and I should have probably shown you this earlier, but there are two ways to look at project management. You could look at it from the lens of traditional, which is the scope is fixed. 
the schedule and the budget are estimated. Do you work in a company where management's major concern is, let's fix that scope so everything else stays the same? <laughs> I, I can tell you it doesn't work. People think it does, it doesn't. Then we have the world of agile where we flip this triangle on its head and scope is flexible or estimated and schedule and budget are fixed. What do I mean by that? What I just showed you was an example of a time box. If you fix the time box, the question is what scope can I fit in? You see, the scope is now flexible. The time box is rigid, but the scope that you fit in is flexible, right? So some visual conceptualizations in project management. We have predictive project management, looks like that. We have the world of agile, which looks like this because it's a series of experiments or iterations to get to your goal. And very popular in PMI space today, we have a hybrid, hybridization. Combine agile and predictive to give you the best of both worlds, okay? But the one I really want to hone in on is this one, linear, right, for the most part. Even though in what we call traditional project management, we find that change still happens. It's just how we manage change that's different. So for the traditional project management piece, your best bet is to go down the route of the process groups. Understand that there are five groups of processes. Like I said in the beginning, as we will fill in the application form, you've got initiating, you got planning, you got executing, monitoring, and controlling, and closing. Five groups of processes, okay? What do we do in these five groups? Let me break it down very quick for you. The very first one is initiating. This is where we develop a project charter, and on top of that, we identify our stakeholders. Second thing we do is plan, planning, right? We plan everything under the sun. Scope, schedule, cost, quality, resources, communications, risk procurement, and stakeholder. Then we have executing. This is where you're carrying out the work, you're executing the plan, you're creating deliverables, you are auditing the work process and so on. Then we have monitoring and controlling where you are reporting on the project and you're making changes. And then we have closing, right? You're closing out either a phase in the project or the entire project. The deliverable is transitioned, the final report is created, you're examining drivers, the lessons learned are archived and more. Okay, output, project charter from initiating, project management plan from planning, the deliverable from executing with good leadership, the output from monitoring and controlling are these work performance reports majorly, and then from closing, it's the transitioning of what you did. Okay, hit the pause button and take a screenshot because this might help you as you fill in your application form. Let's take it to the final step before we close out for today. On top of all this, you got what I call the process group Pentagon. Because we got five groups of processes, but we also have 10 areas of knowledge that span across these groups of processes. So here are the knowledge areas and they're not in any particular order, and they are not on the different pieces of the Pentagon for any deliberate reason. It's just the way the visual ended up being. All right, so the areas of knowledge are as follows. Let me give you a breakdown of the knowledge areas first before um, anything else. So we have integration, which is the overall coordination of the project. This is what project managers must not compromise. You ever pulled your hair out feeling I'm all over the place? I don't know what's going on. Oh, maybe you're challenged in integration. You're not able to keep it cohesively. And honestly, a lot of PMs are not that great in keeping everything together. They're good in one area or two or three, but you got to be an all-rounder. Integration is what mimics that, being an all-rounder. So everything coming next, you got to combine them. All right, what is next? Scope. Scope management, schedule management, cost management, quality management, resource management, communications management, risk management, procurement management, and stakeholder management. You got to be able, this is what I'm saying in essence, you got to be able to combine all these pieces. Let's go back. 
you got to be able to combine, if I can get my pen to work, all these pieces, you got to be able to combine them, unify them, coordinate them. And when you do that, that's what integration is all about. So integration brings it all together. All right. So to finish off the visual, you got integration, scope, schedule, cost, quality, resources, communications, risk procurement, stakeholder management, and that's what forms the knowledge areas. So what have we learned today? We've learned about the PMP exam, a ton about the PMP exam, but I've also taken you through how to complete the application. I've taught you some agile. I've taught you the process groups. Now I've taught you the knowledge areas. Final thing before you go. You can't go without principles. So what did we learn in the Agile Manifesto? Individuals and interactions, right? Over processes and tools and so on. The layer at the bottom, those are principles. And that's going to help you up the ante on the individuals and the interactions. Okay? So at the bottom there, I have 12 principles from the PMI, which are very leadership focused. That is the final thing I'm going to show you today. Here we go. The 12 principles from the Project Management Institute. Number one, you got to be a good steward. You got to be responsible. You got to be diligent and respectful. Respectful to the resources entrusted to you, be they human, equipment, material, supplies, facilities. Number two, collaborate. You got to create a collaborative project team environment. Number three, you got to effectively engage stakeholders. You got to effectively engage them from a point of collaboration. You got to think team customer. I look at a lot of people, they, they're always moaning about their customer. Oh, my customer, my customer, my customer. Hi, Uchi, how are you doing? Good to see one of my friends from the training program. Good to see you, Uche. How are you? Let me know when the big day is. Is it approaching? <laughs> I'll put you on blast, buddy. You can tell me in secret. Don't worry. All right. Number four, value. It just says focus on value. You got to focus on value. If it's not valuable, don't do it. Number five, systems. Recognize, evaluate, and respond to systems interactions. Number six, leadership. Demonstrate leadership behaviors. Number seven, tailor. Tailor based on context. Tailoring is so important. And all this is saying is take all of this project management stuff and appropriate it to your project as needed. You can't use or shouldn't use the whole kitchen sink for every single project. Number eight, quality. Build quality in. Think Kaizen, fitness for use. Conformance to requirements, customer satisfaction. Number nine, complexity, navigate complexity, break it down. The way to navigate complexity, just break it down, break it down, break it down. You know, I know the Peter people are going to be mad at me, but the saying goes, how do you eat an elephant? A bite at a time. <laughs> it's not a very nice visual, but all they're trying to say is how do you attack a big problem? How do you attack complexity? You break it down. And that helps you to become more agile. You break it down, break it into iteration. That's all this is saying. Number 10, risk. Optimize risk responses. Makes sense. Make sure you select the best risk approach for the situation and for the project. Number 11, adaptability. Embrace adaptability and resiliency. It just says be agile. That's the summary of this. And number 12, change. Enable change to achieve the envisioned future state. And with that, my friends, we've come to the end of our presentation for today. If you really mean business and you want to be with one of the best in the business, you want to be with a buddy who has not only gotten certified, but has shown prowess in the world of predictive and agile, someone who has actually gotten their feet wet and hands dirty in various industries, various companies like Honeywell and Motorola and Caremark at the time, now CVS, right? American Airlines, 
Skillsoft. I mean, the list goes on and some of my clientele, you know, I'm very well. The FBI is one of my clientele, U.S. Army, the Air Force, the U.S. Air Force out in Europe, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers who I volunteered for. So many firms worldwide, Department of Transport, Department of Commerce. If you truly mean business, I just want to encourage you to hit the button to join. Why wouldn't you join a program that is created by someone that has the kind of experience that I have? It's not all that fluff stuff that you see, like someone who was microwaved and came out of the oven like yesterday. No, I got certified in 20, 2005. Sometimes I forget when I got certified. 2005. I know that's going to date me. Oh, my goodness. That's 18 years. People who are 18 already, they're working. <laughs> they're grown and working. So I hope this uh, gives you some confidence to join my program again. My program is called Elite PMP, and to join, all you need to do is go on down to tinyurl.com forward slash Elite PMP when you join the program. Right here, whether it's LinkedIn or wherever you found this, I need you to message me because I have some really awesome freebies for you. If you do join the program, send an email to support at praiseon.com and let me know. I'm going to verify that you really joined the program. Please join the program. And then I am going to send you a boatload of additions. I'm going to send you this book. I'm going to send you this book. I'm going to send you a third book. And I'm going to load you on ammo. I call it ammo. Knowledge ammo to ace the exam. you got to understand where I'm coming from. I'm a pragmatic trainer. This isn't about passing the exam alone. No. This is about long tail. I want to see you dominate in the project management space. I want to see you doing great things. I want to see you blowing it up, getting the bag, being a boss. I want to see you being a boss, not playing the small game on oh, project manager. I'm just working the best I can. I, no, none of that. None of that. I want to see you blow this thing up. If you mean business, I want you to join my course today and you have a friend for life. You have someone who will always help you get to that next level. All right. So I don't know what you're waiting for. Are you still there? Seriously? <laughs> Go to tinyurl.com, Elite PMP. Let's get this show on the road. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me. And I look forward to seeing you again, hopefully soon. Those of you who are hiding, and I see you, some of you, my students, you're hiding. You don't want to get certified, but I'm looking for you. I've got at least 20 to 30 delinquent PMPs at any time, but I usually catch up with them. I find them. I find them. Like the bounty hunter, I find them. I get them certified. All right. Thank you very much. I wish you all the very best. You take care and bye for now.